you're watching Inside the Gilliverse, talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. Brought to you by Stewart Travel Guitars. See the incredible stowaway travel guitar at stewartguitars.com. Also brought to you by Idea Bench, makers of hot rod inspired pedal boards and pedal board accessories at ideabench.com. Microphones for Inside the Gillivers are brought to you by Rode Microphones. Now, please welcome your hosts, Tom Schnauz and Eric Broadbent. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for episode nine of Inside the Gillivers, where we'll be talking all things Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul. My name is Eric Broadbent, and it comes with great pleasure to always welcome my co-host, writer, director, producer for those shows we just talked about, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, Mr. Tom Schnauz. Tom, welcome back, my friend. Good to be here. I think you need to list more credits for me. Okay, we'll get. To, hey, I'll work on some more. I'll, I'll on the script for next week. <laughs> Good to be here as always. Uh, you know. This is a uh, this is a guitar show originally, and it's a tough week. It is it's a lot of guitar fans. We lost Mr. Andy Van Halen this week. It's a, you know what a, what an amazing what an amazing guy, amazing guitar player. And uh, also this week today is uh, John Lennon's would have been his 80th birthday. Wow! So somebody who had a great influence on my life. Uh, anyway, just wanted to mention that before we move on to our very special guest. You know him, you love him. Crazy Eight, Domingo Molina, <laughs> Mr. Max Arcinega is here. Uh, somebody I, you know, before the pandemic, I used to be able to walk around my neighborhood and occasionally bump into him in the streets, just uh, walk into our uh, favorite uh, coffee shop here. But uh, it's been a while since I've seen you in person. But good to see you here on the, on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you guys having me. And yes, I miss those uh, those little special moments in uh, Studio City, running into that what, Aroma Cafe, right? That's right. Shout out to Aroma Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great little spot. But thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. And for everyone. Well, thanks for doing this. Oh, it's oh, a pleasure. I tuned in. Much love to you guys, too. It's just so nice to have a you know an actor that uh, and character that's spanning on both shows. And we get that luxury with a few characters, not everybody that we love. But some of them carry over for both series, and it's so cool, you know, just to to you know experience this. And and we're going to ask you a couple of questions about that later on too. How like looking at things in reverse or fast forward, uh, and how you deal with that. But before I jump into any of our questions, and Tom, thank you as well too for addressing Eddie Van Halen. I appreciate that; it means a lot to me and our, our guitar fans here on the channel, and of course uh, for you as well too uh, with your influences. Um, but there's a question from my good friend Eamon. Eamon helps us out a lot here on the channel as well, too. Sometimes we do dress rehearsal here on the show, and uh, Eamon either plays a role of Tom or my friend Matt plays a role of our, our guest just to make sure everything's working smooth. And Eamon has a question for Max right off the hop. Uh, how does he really eat his sandwiches, crust on or crust off? Uh, <laughs> no crust in real life. I don't eat crust on sandwiches. Really? Like, yeah, yeah. So when I saw him do that, I was I was really excited. I was like, these guys love me. They know me. <laughs> Did they actually I think the important the, the important question to ask right now is that you guys shot the pilot for Breaking Bad back in 2006? Seven. 2007. 2007. Yeah. 2007. How do you look exactly the same now as you did then? What what are you is this are you sucking on children's blood? Is there or bathe, what are you bathing in? What how, what's your secret? Shout out to my father who has uh, just very, very good genes. And uh and I'm always asked, they're like, what do you do? And I was like, uh, I just, uh, I bathe in city water, just city water. And that's ah, it. That's how I wash my face. Nothing else. That's my, uh, well, you, you should, you should take, you should bottle that bath water you bathe in and sell it. <laughs> Cause I would, I would drink that up. <laughs> uh, so 2000, 2007, you're on this pilot for the show Breaking Bad. Yeah. Did you have any inkling at the time of what this was going to become and and I'd love to hear any memories you have about being on the set and shooting with Vince and Aaron Paul and and Brian and yeah. any stories you have. We'd love to hear. Yeah, no, uh, Breaking Bad came, it was in 2007. It was pilot season. I'd been in LA for about three years. And it was my first pilot season that I actually started getting out a lot. And so I was just excited to be auditioning and uh, it was a super busy time. And Breaking Bad was one of the pilots that I auditioned for. And when I first went in to read for Sharon Bialy, I actually read for the role of Jesse Pinkman. Um, I'm not sure if at the time they were thinking, you know, could be a Hispanic kid that from New Mexico that, you know, they're looking at. So I went in and I read for, for that role. 
And then uh, I, I would say about a week later, I got called back in for uh, Crazy Eight. And um, and then when I got the job, I remember getting a call from my manager at the time, and she was just like, uh, she said, "Hey, you booked this, uh, so you booked this uh, this gig." And I was like, "Which one is it?" And she's like, uh, "Breaking Bad." And I was just like, "Which? I don't remember that one. Which one is that?" And then you know, it was it was literally that casual. And she's like, "It's the one that's shooting out in New Mexico." And I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay." And she's like, "You're gonna fly it in a couple of days, so so let's get you let's get you ready." And honestly, I just you know I had no idea. You know, when I read the pilot, is the first time that you know I was really excited about the material. Um, it was almost kind of like too good to be true, and no real expectations. Honestly, I had you know it was on AMC. I think they possibly did. They have what the Mad hell is that? Right? Yeah. Did they have Mad Men at the time? I don't even think they had Mad Men at the time, or it could have been like the first or second show. Yeah, and, Mad Men uh, was first, and then Breaking Bad. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so. So I got the job and we got flown out there. It was my first time in New Mexico. Um, I had I, I hopped on the plane and Sharon Bialy happened to be the casting director happened to be on the flight and she sat next to me. And uh, when we landed, um, she saw that I only had like a t-shirt on, and she's like, "Hey, Sudi," she goes, "Did you end up packing some 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 jackets and coats?" And I was like, "No, why?" And she's like, "It gets it gets really really cold out here." And I was like, really? In New Mexico? <laughs> you don't think so, right? <laughs> I was, you know, just so ignorant and ridiculous. I, I had no idea that it got so cold in New Mexico. And when we arrived, it was snowing. And first, my first stop was to, to buy a jacket. And um, I remember getting there, you know, it, it was just, you know, like anything else, just excited as an actor to have a job and to go out there and, you know, have a good time. And then I met everyone. I started meeting, you know, I met... Um, I met everyone at the, uh, they had a, a, like the dinner for the, uh, for the cast. And I remember, um, I looked over and I saw Aaron Paul there and, you know, he was kind of like the young guy. And so I was like, let me go speak to this guy. And I walked up to him and this, these are one of my memories here. And I walked up to him and I said, I said, Hey, uh, I didn't even introduce myself. I just said, I said, Hey, do you, uh, do you happen to play poker? And you know, his <laughs> eyes lit up. He's like, what? <laughs> What? Does Aaron Paul play poker? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so I, he immediately fell in love with me as soon as I asked him that question, and he's like, "Yeah, of course." And I was like, "There's a shuttle that leaves our hotel that takes us to this place called the Sandia Casino." I said, "He's like, when does it leave?" I was like, "In the next like 15 minutes," and he's like, "Let's go." <laughs> so we literally the dinner was over, and we hopped in a in a van, went back to the hotel, and uh, went up to the Sandia Casino to play some poker, and that's where uh, you know that was our first first start to the friendship and the i think we were there for like six weeks i think they gave us an ounce, a nice amount of time to shoot the pilot wow nice yeah and so we were there and so we were just excited to be there and we had a, we had a, an amazing time we had no idea it was one of those where you like you read an amazing script and you're just like no one's gonna see this so it was uh, six weeks that's like three episodes for us now <laughs> yeah exactly yeah it, I mean, I, it might not. I, I don't know if it was six weeks, but I know it was a few weeks for sure. It might have been, yeah. Yeah, because I remember, you know, being every, everything moved slowly, and we had a really chance to get to know each other. I remember sitting in the hotel lobby, and they were reading R.J. Mitty and one other actor. It was down to like two actors, and they were hmm. reading them inside the uh, the room there. And I think I was talking to, uh, I think it was another actor or someone, a producer. And they're like, yeah, they're getting ready to finally cast this role. And, RJ Mitty walked out of there with the role in hand. Wow. So it was really, really exciting. That's great. That's great. Do you remember who, whose idea was it? Did you, did you ever find out who decided to say the kid who, the kid who read for Jesse Pinkman, let's try him for crazy eight. Was it, was it Vince or was it, was it Ch uh, Sharon or who? Uh, you know who I got uh, the call from the casting director. Yeah. From Sharon Bialy. Cause when I went back in to read, uh, I did just read back in the office again, and I remember just kind of playing it completely different, and you know, uh, based on what was on the page and stuff. So it was a brilliant whoever's idea was was a brilliant because you were such a sweet guy and <laughs> crazy, you know, such a hard ass bastard that yeah. it was a brilliant uh, casting choice to have you come back and read for that. You you nailed it. We you know you made an impact on the show. I mean, it was really it, it helped. It helped set this whole thing in motion. Thank you so, so much. I feel yeah. like I've been hogging the questions. Uh, Eric, I want to get to let you or, or, or some of the fans jump in here. All good. I got a ton of questions, but I don't want to. 
I don't want to dominate. No problem. No no apologies necessary. Well, the, it's, there's a couple of questions about the, the character uh, here as well, too. One is from Karina. And, uh, and, and Max, I saw a couple of your interviews where you've explained some of this in some other details as well, but we'll share for people that haven't seen this about doing that scene with the pole. You're chained up there. And I was going to get my bike lock tonight for decoration just for you. And I forgot <laughs> I've got the exact same bike lock. Um, but anyways, I forgot to get it. But um, you, there's, the scene was shot a couple of times at close ups and then far back, whatever. But Karina's question is, so Max, you really spent nine hours being chained in that basement. How hard was that scene? It was hard. It was a, they were, you know, it was a long day. And, uh, you know, I think when you're, you know, when you're working, you try to find, you know, little things you can do as an actor to kind of get you into the, into the mood and into the feeling of what the character is experiencing. And I remember just sitting there on the, uh, you know, on the floor and, um, Adam Bernstein was directing and, and I just had a, you know, when I got there at the beginning of the day, I just thought to myself, I wonder what it'd be like to actually sit here, you know, overnight or be here as long as, you know, he actually was. And. So I asked Adam if he'd get, if he'd allow me to just stay there throughout the whole day without, you know, going anywhere. Wow. Um, and he said, yeah, I mean, let me just clear it with uh, Karen Moore, who was producing at the time, and uh, see if that's okay. And they gave me the okay. And and then everyone started betting that I wouldn't, you know, <laughs> allow to stay there all day without moving. <laughs> and that's another memory. And, and sure enough, you know, I have some really cool back, uh, behind the scenes footage uh, that I, I happened to buy a camera at the time and it was the first like 1080p handheld cameras that they put out. And I had one with me and I gave it to Aaron Paul and Aaron went around and literally did all of this behind the scenes. So I have this like amazing, really cool footage that wow. when I get time, I'll be able to like post some of that really, really cool stuff behind the scenes. Awesome. And, um, and so in sell it to Sony and, and get it on the uh, extra <laughs> Blu-ray edition. Yeah, so yeah. You yeah, you're you're right actually. Yeah, I have to I have a lot. It's really really cool stuff too. It's got Brian in there. It's got so many people uh on that pilot episode and the whole idea was that they were betting money that I wouldn't be able to stay there and uh <laughs> and, and sure enough, I stayed there the whole day. Uh everyone went to lunch and um I sat there and Aaron and Brian brought me my lunch and they sat in the basement with me and had lunch and you know, we uh we had a, we had a, we had a fun time and, and it really helped. I mean, yeah, for sure. The following day, my butt was sore. My tailbone was so sore and your back probably it, leaning against that. Yeah. Yeah. My back. And, but it really helped out with getting into, into the, into the space of the character and, 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 you know, it really helped me as, as an actor. So I agree. That's hey. amazing that that was your idea because Vince, uh, I knew Vince back at NYU and he did a student film and I acted in his film playing a clown. And he asked me to sleep overnight in the character's outfit to get into the role oh, of the character. So somehow you sensed that Vince would want you to do that. So oh, that's amazing. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> I need to see this short film, Tom. No, you don't. Yeah. You, just, you really, really don't. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, the documentary on John Wayne Gacy or anything, was it? No, no. no. It was, okay. uh, Vince did a film called Mime, Mime Pays, where three, three clowns kidnap a mime who are who's horning in on their corner where they're, where they're, uh, you know, chilling for, for cash. So they want to, they want to kill this mime and get rid of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Like one of the clowns that kidnaps the mime. Uh, I'll talk to you anyway. after the interview. Send, send it to me. <laughs> well, I can see how that certainly did help as well too, getting into the character. Um, and a lot of people, they, they really sense that, right. That you were there that whole time. It's not like you just take off, you go sit in a nice lounge with a massager on your back. You know, you, you really got the, uh, the, the experience from it. And there'll be another question coming up here in a second about that as well, too. Um, but there's a question, and this is really cool. This will take care of one of my questions. This is a fan question coming up. One of the things I was going to point out about how cool this was to have um, a key character uh, in the show, um, Gus's partner, Max, named after you. A lot of people, I'm sure, know this, um, but some people don't. And so, and it was a couple times, and even Vince hasn't pointed it out uh, that whether the, the sexuality of Max, whether, you know, it was Gus's lover or whatnot, but, uh, let me see where, who is the person asking the question? Um, I got to go back and get it now. So I scrolled a little too far. This is from Maddie. Will you can, will you commit to saying Max is Gus's lover? And I don't think anyone actually knows. Do you know? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I really don't, you know, um, I was aware that Vince tends to name characters after, you know, people he likes. Mm -hmm. So I was happy when he called me and asked me if it was okay to name a character in, in the show. Um, but that's as far as it went in terms of, you know, any backstory 
um, you know, that's, that's left up to him and, and the writers and the creators. So I don't know. I, I always assumed that he was, mm-hmm. yeah, I always assumed he was, that was just my opinion on it, but I've heard different, different, uh, things on it. So I really can't say, I, but when, as a, as a fan and watching the show, I, I always thought that he was. I think you could feel it too. Cause when, when, uh, when Hector took him out at the pool there, uh, Don Lodigo's pool, you could see there was more than just losing a business partner. You know, the emotion was so like he, he was just it was gutted. You know what I mean? He was so empty yeah. with that loss. Yeah. And it, sometimes you certainly it's good not say to- every, everything Gus has done is all a chain from that moment. They're all his revenge against the cartel is, is uh, because of that. You know, everything he does is because of that moment. Yeah. There's a question. I'm not sure if I understand it fully from Aya is saying, hi, Max, you're, uh, why was your name uh, Domingo in Better Call Saul? Uh, does that mean, um, does that mean anything to you? Well, Domingo was your, like the real name. Uh, and you went by crazy eight as kind of the street name, correct? Yeah. 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 It means a lot to me. I mean, you know, you're meeting, uh, you're not meeting crazy eight in uh, better call Saul. You're meeting Domingo Molina. And, uh, that alone allows me obviously to play the character in a completely different time and a completely different, uh, you know, um, energy as well. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a difficult thing, you know, it's trying to figure, you know, when I did the first episode and they reintroduced my character, I knew, you know, just from him being in the Tampico furniture outfit in the, in the, in the van that what he said in the basement and, you know, uh, season one was actually true because I'd always get that question, you know, uh, was crazy eight lying in the basement about everything that he was talking about in terms of going to school and working for his father. Was that a lie to try to get, uh, close to Brian, uh, his character, Walter White. And, um, and that was the interesting thing about trying to play that basement scene was how do you find these nuances and these levels to keep the audience, uh, almost on the edge of their seat and not too sure what's true and what's not. And that was the challenge of trying to do that scene and, and trying to pull them in to make sure that they start, you know, uh, having feelings for who this person was as a person. And, uh, you know, that's always the beauty of it, right? So how, how long can you keep them on the edge before you pull out that, you know, broken piece of plate? And yeah. so uh, when I did the first episode of Better Call Saul, I mean, you're talking about um, seven, eight years later. And so, you know, it gave me a complete, it was great because it was a complete, I was so detached from Crazy 8 at the time. And so it was going to take me a little while to kind of find that energy again and, I'd wa- I did watch the episodes a few times before I shot just to kind of remember the slight accent that I was using and the tone of his voice because uh, I-, I speak a little deeper with him. And um, so that took a little while. But, th- but then I said to myself, am I going to use that? Is he there yet? And so trying to play with the voice as I moved along throughout the episodes leading up to season five, it's, it's, it hasn't been easy. It's not easy. You know, you, you have to try to, you know, uh, do a lot. In, in, in very little amount of time and because they write in such a cinematic way. Um, so it's really trying to find those nuances and trying to find those tiny details, those little things that can reveal character as you move from episode to episode. And so that's been, that's been, that's been tricky, but yes, playing Domingo is, is, is perfect as an actor. It gives me a completely different character to play period until you slowly, you know, start to build and see what happens to him and what he's experienced and, you know, leading up to the uh, prison scene, because, you know, in, in, in the scene uh, where Jimmy comes to talk to him, you know, there's that thing, you know, when he first comes into the room, Domingo comes in and tries to act hard like he's already <laughs> that guy. And he's not because as soon as he tells him that Tony Dalton's character sent him, he became a little puppy again. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, it's like, no, I didn't say anything, please. You know, that kind of thing. So it's interesting right. to play those moments, you know, trying to find that back and forth of like he's trying to be this person and he's becoming this person but as an actor the hard part is like don't give it away just yet it's coming it's coming so that's been that's been tricky not fully broken yet the uh, domingo wasn't really broken yet it's getting close but you know there's gonna be some hardship coming you know that's gonna really push him to that uh kind of okay that's all we're doing now is the hardcore drugs uh you know selling them and being a distributor and you know, that kind of thing. Well, here's a question. You've almost answered all of that as well, too, but it's going back to that scene again, because that's an iconic scene uh, downstairs uh, with uh, Walt, you know, contemplating, him, is he going to kill you or not? This is from Bob. Um, and again, it's, it's, some of it's been addressed, but it says, Max, your scene in the basement when Walt is looking for a reason to let Crazy 8 go uh, is truly compelling. 
uh, how did you achieve that kind of realism and, and total uh, believability in your performance? So you you know you talked about what the characters say and talked about the furniture store and stuff like that as well too. But as you as the actor, were there any things that you took to uh, to re- really sell it home? Yeah, I think you know with television, you know things move fast, you know, and uh, I got lucky because uh, Adam Bernstein. Uh, rightfully so, brought us into, uh, you know, to kind of read the scene on a Saturday. And I think a lot of it had to do with like, you know, who's this guy? Who's this kid that's playing Crazy 8 that's going to, you know, do this monster scene with Brian Cranston? <laughs> Let's make sure he knows what he's doing, you know? <laughs> and uh, and so he brought us in over the weekend and uh, on a Saturday and Brian and I just sat in the basement and kind of just, you know, we weren't off book just yet. Um but we were reading the scene out loud just to kind of hear it out loud. And, and, and then uh, afterwards, Brian and I went out to uh, hang out for the day, went to catch a movie, have, you know, have some food. And we had, a, we had a, just a great day of just getting to know each other. And then uh, the day of, you know, it was uh, just very, very professional, very, um, we were ready to go. And, but we had a nice, you know, connection and we were, we felt safe and, and, you know, to be honest with you, uh, you know, when you're working with an actor like Brian, listening is the most important thing in those types of scenes. I mean, you just have to listen. And I think as actors, it's one of the hardest things to do. And it's the most important thing to do, right, is to just listen in the scene. And when you're listening and you're being affected by what's happening, um, it, you know, the scene begins, you know, the work's already done. These writers, you know, are, are, are excellent. You know, they, they, they write very, very well and it's all, it, it's doing all the work for you. And so you just have to be present, you know, make some strong choices up front, but not be married to them. You know, mm-hmm. you do the work and then you slowly allow, allow yourself to let go. And having Brian, I remember looking across and he has that moment where he starts crying. And so I was like, oh, this is perfect. You know, I, this is a great way for me to then you know, use my tactics to get what I want in the scene. And the fact that he was already melting in that way made it a little bit easier to start telling him even more and more personal stories about my experience. And so, so it's a combination of a few things. Yeah. It's funny. You're the second, well, there's probably been a couple of actors that have said this before uh, Tom and I started the Gilliver show here. I was, I interviewed a few of the cast and uh, one of the, one of the first few I had on was Charlie Baker, Skinny Pete. And oh, he, yeah. he said the same thing as well, too. I mean, he's off when he's not doing his lines. He's just sitting there and he may look like he's rehearsing his lines, or whatever. He is listening and he's like peripheral vision. He's watching and listening and taking everything in like a sponge. So that's a very, very valuable tip. Uh, we have a couple super chat questions that come in. Uh, this is one of our regulars here. This is from Shawshank. It says, Max, um, where were your thoughts on how you structured the character in your head to make him so sympathetic? Those interactions with Walter White were pure gold. So obviously, yeah, that's a very similar question we've talked about. But, you know, being sympathetic and you you weren't really, well, I guess at that point, you, the character was broken. But, you know, the, there was a lot of sympathy, um, you know, for 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 life itself. Is there any any tricks on that as well? Yeah, I think, you know, characters are so multifaceted, you know, and if you allow yourself to just look at it at face value on the page, um you'll get stuck in, you know, just very specific choices. Right. And again, the writing was just so great. And so that opens me and allows me to do, to play in so many different ways, you know, believing, you know, what it is that I was saying and having had those experiences about working with my dad, those are all genuine, you know? And so what I'm going to do at the end of the scene with the, you know, broken piece of plate is going to be done. But leading up to that, you know, I, I can't do that until I'm 100% sure that I'm going to convince him to let me go. So as soon as I, you know, see something in Brian's eye and Walter White's eye that I feel like, oh, I think I got this guy, you know, slowly just watching him. And like, I would smile on purpose, you know, when we're talking about the song and the Tampico Furniture song. Um, you know, these were moments that I'm just like, oh, this is like just beautifully written because I can really just like charm him and charm him and charm him and <laughs> And then, you know, get him to go upstairs and get that key. And so uh, I looked at those moments, you know. Um, you know, what's funny, Tom, a story is that, you know, uh, the, the, the jingle was written on the page. And Brian and I, when we were doing the, the scene, uh, there was no arrangement to the uh, song. Oh, you're making it up. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I just, it, it just hit me. Brian's like, what do you think it sounds like? And I was like, ah, let me think for a second. And, and then I just started kind of humming it. And then I was like, well, what do you think about this? And then Adam's like, I kind of like it. And then Brian's like, yeah, I like it. 
And here's, you know, here's some advice that Brian, I think, has brought up in other interviews or he brought up in his book or something like that. He's like, oh, yeah, he brought it up in his book about the idea of whistling. He'd whistle tunes on uh, Malcolm in the Middle so he can get paid uh, residual money because it's an arrangement, right? So he, so Brian told me, he said, hey, Max, at the end of the day, he goes, don't forget to register with BMI and give that information uh, to Sony so that way you can get residual money. I was, you know, I was like, I, I don't, you know, as a young actor, you just, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. I don't want to think that I'm trying to take <laughs> it for the money. And like an idiot, I didn't, I didn't send over the, uh, the thing. And when I started seeing the residual money coming in for Breaking Bad, I was like, oh, uh, is it, done it man. is that why Walt was doing it when he was, when they were doing the bug bombs? Was that why Walt did that? Or was that just written in the script? Like, cause Walt was doing a lot of whistling there, you know, Jesse takes off and he's zips up the tent. Uh, you know, at the Vomino's past. That was scripted, I think. Okay. I think uh, that 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 scene he was scri- he was scripted a particular song, but that was not money yeah, they, that Brian would have gotten. They were already <laughs> they were probably already on to Brian doing that on other shows. They're like, don't <laughs> let that guy whistle. Don't we let had, that- I mean, our guest next week, Michael McKeon, He, I know, he has some original tunes. I know. I think he whistled whistled in one of my episodes. Yeah, he did. When he had something, so I'm, I'm pretty sure he got paid for that. That's Tommy cool. Or, Tom, you think I get any of that retro? Uh, <laughs> uh, I that wish. Retro pay. <laughs> Too late. And meanwhile, I do that on this show, and I get a copyright strike, so I got to be careful. <laughs> here's a here's a super chat from the Saul Goodman Twitter account. Saul Goodman Twitter is awesome. Uh, it says, "Don't let shopping strain your braino. Uh, just sing this short ret- refraino. Our furniture is bueno. Tampico is the namo. I just wanted to hear." Eric, sing it. Oh, see, nice, nice. He's so okay now. Okay, so they're gonna come after me. Max, chat about Breaking Bad, the dog scene. Oh yeah, the dog scene. Uh, the dog scene. It was a, uh, it was a fun day. Um, Vince Gilligan was uh, pissed because the dog was out of shape, and so the dog would jump on the uh, on the on the uh, hanging thing, the human, the hanging fake human is what I call it. And he'd do one take, and then the uh, caretaker would come and say, all right, guys, we got to take him to the side. And Vince is like, what's going on? He's like, uh, the dog has to rest. And Vince was just absolutely pissed. He was like, uh, I mean, can he not do another take? He's like, no, 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 the dog's tired. He has to rest. He's like, let's give him some water. And so Vince would try to find, like, you know, bowls of water and some maybe, like, electrolytes or something to get this dog back up to do its job. And but but it was so funny because literally he'd go up, he'd do one take, and then the caretaker would come back and say the dog needs to rest. And so we were just standing around waiting for the dog to get his energy back. And um I mean he was a sweet dog, but you know, he's a terrible actor. I, you know, he yeah. just wasn't in shape. What the Tom very heard? much like I'm like that. I will write <laughs> one or two sentences that I need to take a nap. Yeah. <laughs> well, well Tom, you've always always Vince is always giving me bowls of water to keep me oh. <laughs> Keep it going. You've always said, though, too, like if you're going to write, if a writer's going to write in a pet or, you know, um, they it really needs to be there, right? I mean, be sure about it. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, he was a sweet dog and, you know, we got the job done. Uh, it was, uh, <laughs> it was, it was funny. I, I mean, I was, you know, I, when I first got there, you know, it's a big Rottweiler, so you're a little intimidated. Um, but, you know, dogs can tell when you're a dog person. Yeah. yeah. And uh, luckily, I've had some puppies in my life so that that helps here's another question and there's a couple super chat questions this one was from andrea and i'm just going to grab it again she says when did you realize at yeah when did you realize the first time that your character would be so important for both breaking or for better call saul after breaking bad well i i you know i obviously didn't know that they were doing the prequel i ran into uh vince gilligan at uh one of the editors of breaking Bad, who direct who actually edited the uh, basement scene uh kelly dixon uh, she's a sweetheart. We became friends and we stayed friends throughout the years. And she had a little housewarming party and Vince happened to be there and uh, a few other people were there. And, um, I talked to Vince and I said, Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, Hollywood's coming after you. What are you, what are you working on? And he's like, honestly, he's like, I just, you, you know, we are working on a, a possible prequel to Breaking Bad. And he's like, and if it gets picked up, he's like, uh, there's a possibility that we'll see your character again. Wow. Said, oh cool man i said sweet i said just let me know i'll be i'll be ready to go you know just uh give me a ring and um and so i had a feeling i wouldn't be in uh season one just because you know they're introducing the world and stuff and 
And then I, you know, I got the call for season two and I love the way they, you know, reintroduced and the way they shot it. And, you know, for people that knew the show picked up on those little details and, and the way they have those callbacks when you, uh, when you fast forward to uh, season five, when I'm in jail, the way they uh, introduce uh, the Norris's character. So you're, you know, the cinema, you know, the way they work as directors and it's, you know, very nuanced and unique. And so, you know, I, I, I mean, I knew as soon as they brought me back, I, I had a feeling like, obviously, you know, they're bringing me back for a reason. They're not going to just, you know, bring Fans back characters for the sake of novelty. And so, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I was, I was excited, you know, again, you know, it's an opportunity to revisit this character in a completely different universe. And, you know, as the seasons went by and, you know, as episodes begin to, unravel and you know you begin to see the world take shape um and then especially in season five when you know i see what happens and how he becomes crazy eight you know the nuances of that i'm glad it was that i'm glad it wasn't some over the top you know you know kind of like on the mark thing that he becomes crazy eight just very very excuse me very subtle ways to uh you know do those things and and that's what they're great at and so you know it's exciting it's nice to have happen. have that opportunity to have a see a, yet another character who starts in one place because gus is very close to where he is yeah goes but crazy eight domingo is very far from what we see him in breaking bad is it was great to see his or, origins and also to have this moment in better call saul where in in breaking bad uh, hank says domingo molina is a you know a ci of mine and we were able to luckily put those puzzle pieces together and and make that scene come true and show that yes this is how he is a ci for for uh for hank schrader with this lie that he tells through lalo so uh, that was that was fun to do yeah and i and i and i really like that because there was a you know it was always like the snitch 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 but realistically it wasn't his fault you know it was uh you know and it was all for the cartel so he wasn't really a snitch it was all it was all to help the salamanca family all his all his snitching was to to help take down other uh, uh, outside drug dealers. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a. Here's a. Did I, you? Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, going back to the pilot, Crazy Eight dies <laughs> in that chemical wash. How surprised were you to get the call that the character was back in episode two and three? It was, you know, I, it was it was a shock to be honest with you. <laughs> I went to Aaron's house after uh, he came, we came back from the pilot uh, where he was staying at the time and he showed me the pilot episode and I watched it and I was just, you know, so excited. I was like, man, this looks like a movie. There's no way they're not going to pick this show up. Um, you know, the cinematography by John Toll was ridiculous, you know, and it, it was just amazing. I'd never seen a pilot like that. And, uh, and then I was sad. I was like, oh man, this sucks, you know? <laughs> And, you know, we were jokingly, I was, it would have been just great to like, just go back just so we can hang out again. Cause we had such a fun time during the pilot. So, you know, all the memories were like, it would have been great to just go back to the Sandia casino <laughs> <laughs> and play some more poker. And, you know, and that was it. You know, I was just like, man, this is, there's no, I said to him, I said, there's no way they're not going to pick this show up. Like, it just, there's no way after seeing it, you know, there's no way to, they wouldn't do that. And, um, and sure enough, I remember he, uh, he called me, he called me. And he was in shock. He couldn't believe it. And I had, I, my agent hadn't told me yet. And so when he called me and he's saying, he's like, what, he's like, what happened? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, can you believe it? And I was like, dude, I have no idea what you're talking about. And, um, and he's like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. He's like, they're bringing you back. And I thought it was a joke. I was, I was like, how are they going to bring me back? I I'm died dead. in the, uh... and he's like, no, 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 they're bringing you back. Like you're coming back. And, and then I was like, let me call my agent to, to double check. <laughs> they called me up and, and truthfully, it was just, you know, the excitement of going back. I still felt like, you know, when I read the basement scene, I was like, this sucks. No one's going to see this. You know, no one's going to see this. And, you know, such a great, like, you know, opportunity for an actor to really, you know, flex your, 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 um, your acting skills and, you know, what you've worked hard for to have an opportunity to have a scene like that and have a moment like that. And, and so I was just excited. And so when we got back, it was that same energy that we had from the pilot. And, you know, it was all out mayhem in terms of like, you know, having fun and going out and, you know, roaming the ABQ and, you know, so many memories, just a, an absolute blast. And, and it was very interesting, though, because um, 
you know, after, after that, I was, you know, I was going back to the, to the hustle and that's, you know, going in the rooms and auditioning and auditioning. I mean, just busting them. I mean, busting my butt. Like, I mean, you have no idea. Like it's, it's not uh, easy. I would never, I would never want to be an actor. Man, yeah, yeah. So I was back on the hustle, like hardcore, hardcore, and you know, auditioning, and you know, I was booking some jobs, and you know, it was great. I was, I was blessed to have the opportunity to work, and but about three years go by, and then uh, Breaking Bad hits Netflix, mm. and um, and so you know, there was a lot of people who hadn't seen the show yet, even though there were three seasons in, especially the casting community, and so. All of a sudden, you know, three years later, I'd walk in a room and, you know, one of the casting directors would be like, oh, my God, Max, I just saw Breaking Bad. <laughs> nice. You know, I love the show and I loved what you did. And, and, and then it slowly started happening, you know, the snowball effect of that. And same thing in another casting office, another casting office. And, and truthfully, I mean, you know, that really, really helped me out with, you know, you know, because it's one of those things, you know, about confidence and casting wants to have wants to make sure that you're going to deliver and you're going to do a great job. And um, the more jobs you book, the better it looks that people are taking chances on you and they can count on you and that you're a professional, that you show up and do your job. And, um, and that helped me with uh, getting other jobs. And, and, you know, it was a s slow, slow snowball effect, but it was like three, three and a half years in after the show had already aired. That's right. Well, that's like a, to, to talk to the music world for a while. I remember Kiss when, you know, I'm a Kiss fan as well too. You know, and they had their they had their Kiss Alive album out, and someone asked, uh, you know, Paul Stanley, "What's it like to be rich and famous?" And he goes, "Well, I know what it's like to be famous, but you know, it took quite some time before all that huge success came, right? But then because of that, just snowball and snowball, like you said as well too. And we have talked about that scene quite a bit, but I mean, you know, uh, the the bike lock scene. That, that's the thing. Some people may remember you for the rest of your life for that one scene. And if that's the case, I'm sure you don't mind because they're remembering you. A price of reason sends a super chat." says when you were filming the bike lock basement scene did you ever imagine at the time it would be so iconic and were you surprised when it did and just like the show itself getting picked up by netflix all of a sudden boom but were you surprised thinking this little scene like you kind of said you didn't even know if it was going to be in it and then look at how iconic it is yeah it taught me about the idea of like uh quality over quantity really you know um and also how you know impactful certain characters are uh for the nuances that the writers figure out about the characters, you know? Um, and so, yeah, I had no idea, obviously, uh, you know, I, I remember seeing it for the first time and I, I thought it was so different and impactful. I mean, I, I saw it, you know, um, much later, you know, when it re-aired, you know, you kind of, you're so separated from the experience once you see it on, on TV. Um, but I remember feeling, um, I think it was the first scene on television that, uh, that went on for, I think it was like an eight minute scene or a seven minute scene without commercial break. Um, but it was straight through. And, um, and so, yeah, that experience that, 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 that really, uh, that, that really helped out with, uh, I remember cause they set up the cameras and they really let us go through that entire scene up until he leaves and then goes back upstairs to get the keys. So, um, it felt really good. It almost felt like you were kind of doing a play and it really allowed us to, you know, be in the moment and really explore, explore the character. But, yeah, I mean, one never really has any idea, you know, how the audience is going to um, react to, to what you do. And um, you just give it your best. You, you put all, all the uh, blood, sweat and tears into those opportunities. And, you know, when you get those opportunities, you want to take advantage of those. And so um, I was, you know, just very, very excited that, you know, people loved it and people uh, had that experience. I love the fact that they were rooting for Crazy 8. That was the, that was the hope, you know, to then pull the rug from under them and uh, pull out the, you know, broken piece of plate. And so, um, so yeah, so it's, a, yeah, it's, it, I mean, to be, you know, part of this universe, the Gilliverse, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a blessing. It's been a blessing in my life for sure, because it's really, uh, uh, you know, I've known these people since 2007. I, I have a lot of friends that are part of the, uh, the world there. And I've, I've made insane, you know, just great, great friends, great, great friends. And to be, to still be working in that world and, also doing other stuff. And, you know, when I come back to the show, it's this feeling of uh, literally going back to camp. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. So, yeah. I love How that. good are you at poker? Because I love poker, but I, if you're like really good, I don't want to get in a game with you. <laughs> I, I, you know, I play, I play a little bit. <laughs> but once, this, once this pandemic's over, we'll have to, uh, to join up and, and 
And, absolutely. Uh, I'd be absolutely. Feel some courage. That sounds yeah, like yeah. fun. <laughs> Uh, Tom, this is a question for you. This is a super chat from Shashank. Um, says question for Tom. Um, said last year at the ending of Better Call Saul, the uh, last year's Better Call Saul, they said the ending of, would be better than Breaking Bad as far as coming up to season six. Do you think? Uh, do you think that's still going to be? I mean, you're you're over halfway through now. Uh, is that a lot of pressure to even ask that question? Do you think you're on track? No, I'm not answering that question. Okay. Vince Vince said that in an interview, and I. I, I want to punch him in the, in the nose. Hey, it puts some big shoes, right? You got to fill. <laughs> you can't say things like that because we could fall fat, flat on our face. Right, trying to right. Stick this landing. I don't. I don't know. It would better. You know, it's the two completely different shows. I hope people like where we're going with the ending. I'm not going to say it's better than Breaking Bad or one show's better than the other. They're just different shows. Mm -hmm. They will have different endings. I hope the end, ending of, of Saul is satisfying and good. And, and talked about, but uh, we're not even there yet. So I do, yeah. you know, we have some idea how it might end, but we're not there yet. So okay, that's fair. It could, it could change from where we are right now. Yeah, and at, at a given any 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 minute. Here's a really good question. This is something I know Max was Max. You know, we, we wanted to talk all kinds of Breaking Bad tonight, and I told him I was going to ask about this, and a fan is asking about it. So now we're going to put him on the spot. Uh, Elizabeth says, uh, Max, can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, the academy, this acting academy, and the classes that you have? Yeah, um, I started an acting school called MA School of Acting. And um, it's something that I've had in my mind for years. Um, and it came, it stemmed from, you know, when I grew up in Chicago, you know, and I was, I caught the acting bug in fifth grade. I did a play in fifth grade. And I remember uh, in the neighborhood that I grew up in, there was really no one to talk about. There's no one to talk to about acting. And uh, I didn't, there weren't really many resources. I, I wasn't too sure. You know, it was something that I enjoyed and uh, and I really, you know, kind of I kind of loved. But it was one of those things where I was like, well, no one does this in the in the neighborhood. And so kind of threw it in the back in the back burner. And uh, in high school, it started com coming up for me again. And I was just like, ah, I kind of want to take some acting classes. And um, I think maybe right out of high school, I think it really, really started, you know, um, started picking at me again. And then I just, you know, I. I, I was looking around. I went to the local theaters to see if they offered acting classes and um, got into one acting class. Uh, I think I was doing my general eds at Northeastern Illinois University. And uh, they had a, they had like a, you know, basic acting class there. I took an acting class there and was reminded how much I loved it. And then outside of uh, school, I went and I think it was Victory Gardens Theater was in Chicago was offering like an acting class. And I jumped into that. And then just kind of had to find my way. I, you know, it was, there was no real resources and no one in my neighborhood was an actor and no one was of that world. And so I always thought to myself, I was like, hopefully one day I can, you know, provide a service like that, you know? And um, I went to college, I was a theater major and, but I was also interested in television and film. And so there was a lot of things that I had to learn outside of the theater program, the theater curriculum. Uh, once I got, once I finished my BA, um, and, and so when I moved out to Los Angeles, I was like, well, I love theater and I love TV and film. And so when I gained all the experience over the years, since I, you know, since I moved out, um, I thought to myself, well, I would like to offer something a little bit different, something that's more focused on TV and film. And so, um, that's where the idea stemmed from. And, um, and then uh, I started doing some workshops with, uh, uh, in Chicago, as you know, when I'd come back home, I actually started an acting group in, in Los Angeles with a bunch of friends of mine that's been running for about 10 years. We'd meet like on a Tuesday for a few hours in the evening. It became really, really popular. And so a bunch of actors would come in. It was free. We'd all hang out. We'd uh, work on our auditions. We'd self-tape. And, uh, and I would run, run the class, per se. And from that, I started just, you know, looking at all the uh, things that, you know, we can add to a curriculum. Um, and so I started going back and doing like, uh, workshops, um, in Chicago, um, with a friend of mine who, uh, who's an agent in Chicago. Um, and so, uh, her name's Vilma and Vilma and I started doing these workshops and she was offering it to, uh, some of the talent that she represents. And, you know, we kept doing it and doing it over and, you know, people were really interested and we were offering something very, uh, very unique, uh, came up with a curriculum called in the rooms. Uh, because it's pretty much where we spend as actors all of our time. Most of our time is in the rooms auditioning for casting directors, producers, directors, the studio, the network, or in our own room doing self-tapes. And so I created a, a curriculum called In the Rooms TV Audition Conservatory. 
Acting part one is co-star. Acting part two is guest star. Acting part three is recurring. Acting part four is series regular. And so I have the students go through that process so they get to experience what the audition process is for the overall arc of the actor. And so, um, so through these workshops, they did really well. So it was a, it was an opportunity that came up and I said, you know what, let's just roll it out. Let's see, you know, it's really helping actors out and it's been a blessing. We opened, uh, we were going to open in person in, uh, April, uh, in Chicago, or I believe May, April or May. And then, you know, uh, the pandemic hit and we decided to go online. We were like, let's see if it'll work online. And it ended up working better online. Nice. You know, you, I, I had an opportunity to not only have people from Chicago, which was where the uh, school was going to be based, but now, you know, it's people from all over the country that come in and take classes and it's been an absolute blessing. So um, we're excited. And uh, I start uh, the acting part four tomorrow series regular. We're, we're that far in. So we've had, uh, you know, some great curriculums coming out and this is just my way as, as you know, to kind of give back to my acting community and for, People that don't have access maybe in their neighborhoods or, you know, uh, anywhere now all over the country that can hop on and be part of this, uh, this curriculum. And really, you know, my, my, my goal is to uh, essentially hire working actors to, to, to coach, to coach uh, these workshops and the classes, to give these actors from all over the country an opportunity to train with people that are working actors in the, uh, in the business, in the industry, uh, so they get a, a real hands-on approach um, and that's what I, you know, that's how I want to separate myself from the other acting schools and give people that opportunity. So, well, that's fantastic. You tell, your, fact, you tell your students to spend uh, nine hours on a floor with a bike locked around their neck. To get the character. Uh, they're they're going to get that. They're going to get that as soon as the series regular class starts. <laughs> <laughs> Episode five of the acting school. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. You know what you can do for tips? You can say, okay, now here's our tips and the do's and what uh, not to do. And for the self tapes, you can go back on Twitter and grab Peter Dyseth's uh, little uh, self tape. <laughs> Did you see that one where he's got he's hi I'm Peter uh, Dyseth I'm five foot eleven or whatever he's at or whatever and then all of a sudden his cat comes flying in like launches and he and he lands on the screen and he and he goes oh my god in heaven and just the way he says it it's so hilarious and he's so serious and he's you know doing a serious audition right and self tape and the cat flies in there with cat cat to steal the scene so use that as an example of what not to do. <laughs> Will do. It's a good one. So here's two comments from Aya, Aya Max. So she might not have heard us earlier talking about how you stay so young. So she has a nice comment on that. It says, don't know how you ever grow old or you never grow old. You always look so young and innocent and you're lucky for that, to be honest. So that goes back. Talking about me, right? Yeah, so of, course, of course, of course. So as another tip, I'm, I'm all full of tips tonight. So if you've got that uh, Crazy 8 elixir in some, if you've got a couple drums at home, one's Crazy 8 bathwater, Crazy 8 elixir, and the other is Walter White's acid, make sure you don't confuse the two. Uh, but she's also asking if you could change one thing about the character Domingo, what would it be? And I mean, I don't think really anything needs to be changed. It's so great. But if you could, if uh, something, whether it be from a writing aspect or maybe from the way you approach it as an actor, would you, is there anything you would change and what would it be? Um, no, that, you know, I don't, I don't really look at, you know, um, it's not my job, you know, uh, I, I show up and, you know, the writers are, you know, they, they wrote Breaking Bad the entire series. So, you know, you show up, I've never, people often ask me, you know, how loose are they with, you know, the dialogue and how, you know, how do you approach those things? And, and I tell them, I said, I say every single word that they write and I trust. I have a question. Yeah. Cause I, I only really work within, you know, X-Files, Chris Carter, Vince Gilligan, Frank Spotnitz universe. And they're very, it's like say say the words on the page. Let's let's try to stick to the script. How is that on other shows you've been on? Uh, yeah, it, it it varies. You know, when you're doing primetime television, for the most part, you're sticking to to the script. I think more on cable shows. Um, you know, if you're doing a recurring role, uh, you know, you you begin to build that rapport with the producers and and writers on set. Um, but on Better Call Saul, you say every word. <laughs> There was uh, there was a moment uh, while we were doing um, it was one of the uh, one of the scenes that uh, one of the episodes that I was in that Gordon that Gordon wrote and um, Gordon was there and it, it was a moment where the director had asked me to kind of speed up the line a little bit but there was a there was a there was an uh I think it was an uh and so I I couldn't speed it up because the uh was there. 
And so I asked Gordon, I said, is the idea that there is a pause there because of that, 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 you know, beat per se. And, uh, he's like, yeah, we, yeah. So yeah, it's written because he's not too sure that he's going to do that. I was like, well, I'm, I'm having a hard time because he wants me to say a little bit faster. And so he's like, all right, well, keep the line, keep the, uh, and just do it, you know, try to see if you can do a little bit faster. So. Yeah. That's, that's how crazy we are. One, one word. <laughs> keep the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can't uh, take out the, uh, there's, there's, so, okay, even, even I think we're, we're too nuts. <laughs> <laughs> there's two other Super Chat questions that come in. One is from Ovo Jacob, and this is for Tom. Uh, when did you and the other writers, or when, when you and the other writers started writing Better Call Saul, did you anticipate how hard it would be to bridge the two gaps of both shows? And imagine, too, going into season six now, that's, that timeline is coming up like a, a speeding car towards a brick wall. Was, was it hard to bridge those? It's, it's been difficult. It's, it's been fun. Like, a lot of, like I said, like a lot of, some things... Will fall into place like having uh, Crazy Eight be Hank Schrader's CI. You know that was a, a loose thread that was like, oh, thank God that that works. There's all these loose threads that we're trying to have be logical and not just forced together. And sometimes it magically happens, and other times we're like, eh, this is we're sort of bending to. So it's been difficult. Really, as we get closer, it's it's been much harder to uh, link it all together and have it make sense. But the nice thing too, that, and that's fantastic the way you put it. And we, you know, talked to Dave Porter a while back when he was on the show previous to what's now the Gilliverse here. You know, he's bringing over a lot of cues to make you feel comfortable. You feel like okay, you're there, and yet, you know, Vince wants things different as well too. It's good, two different shows, but you're feeling it's almost like that comfort zone you're in at one point, and you're feeling like it's coming back up again. And just so that's really cool the way you guys are doing that, and everybody involved, not just the writers, but you know, every everything. Um, here are two. Uh, can I ask a question? I, re- I want to find out how was your experience working with Dean Norris and Mike, uh, Stephen Michael Cazada and that yes. that scene in uh, season five. We were uh, so happy when we when we came came up with that. I mean, how was that uh, to do that scene? Oh, it, it was amazing. Uh, I you know Dean and Stephen Michael Cazada, we became friends. You know, uh, on my visits out there, and you know, I'm, I'm really close to Stephen and, and and Dean as well. He was there for the pilot, so we all hung out. So you know, it, it was exciting to have an opportunity to work with them. You know, you see them on the screen all the time. And it was funny. It was interesting. I had a moment where I was looking across the table and I, I saw their faces and I was just so, you know, you, you're so used to seeing them in the Breaking Bad world that sitting there and I looked at them, I had that just a very slight weird moment as an actor of like, you know, why am I here with uh, these guys, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, I had to, you know, do my job. But, but it was amazing. We had such a great time. It was so much fun. You know, they're pros. It's great to see uh, everyone has a different style of working. And, you know, it's good to see kind of the way Dean does his thing, the way Steven does. And then, um, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Saul Goodman himself. It's just amazing. You know, that was a, that was another great opportunity to work with him. I, you know, I was hoping that we'd had a, have a scene together. And, uh, you know, he's a, he's a I, Chicago I, So I, we... Uh, we were I talking. didn't even realize. I totally forgot that that you had not had a scene with him up until, yeah, up until that scene. I yeah. keep thinking of it as you're, you know, you being with uh, Hank Schrader and and Gomez. But uh, oh my God, that's right. You're if you're first scene with uh, Saul Goodman. Yeah, yeah, and that was a great time. We uh, we bonded over the uh, Chicago Cubs, our favorite baseball team. Nice. And uh, the Cubs happened to be playing that day, and so during takes, we we had a little iPad with the game on, and oh, so cool. we were able to bond over that. So that was exciting. Awesome. Uh, two last super, two, three last super chats here. Uh, one from Andrea says, "Inside the Gilliverse rocks," and it's so funny because I'm getting voice to text from Sandra, and actually I, I'm, I had to check the chat because she, if I get it from voice to text, it says, "Inside the Killer versus rocks." <laughs> voice to text. <laughs> so there you go. Hey, you know what we should ask real quick, Tom? Max, oh, he saw the episode last night. Did you see when we asked Vince what it smells like in the Gilliverse? Did you see that? Wait, did I see that? Yeah. Did you see when we asked him that question? We, we, there's a repeating question we asked. What is, what is to you? What does it smell like inside the Gilliverse? Oh, uh, it smells like money. <laughs> oh, I like that one. I like that one. Okay, take. Okay, <laughs> get one more guess. Anything? Uh, money and what? It's a, it's a two word answer. It's a two thing answer. Um. Money and uh, uh, cool water cologne. Okay, well that's cool, Tom. Right, go- that's an acceptable answer. Yeah, we'll take the that. right answer. As as people who watch the show regularly know, the right answer is bacon and fear. <laughs> I would have never guessed that. Yeah. 
Um, that's that's I love that. And Vince goes bacon. It's got to be bacon and something. I'm like, yes, you got bacon. I mean, how would you get bacon? But that's good. Uh, Shawshank says, Tom, it's been wonderful seeing you as a co-host on the show. I agree 100. Wish you all the best for season six and great conversation with Max. Wonderful initiative. Uh, thank you, Shawshank. It has been a beautiful uh, uh, run. And uh, this, I want to, I want to let people know again too how Tom has been so gracious here. Tom and I talked about four episodes. We're gonna. This is number nine. Okay, four is gonna be done at four. And I've asked Tom to stay one more, please, and not for <laughs> not for me because we have a really cool uh, guest coming on next week. Obviously, Michael McKeon, uh, Chuck McGill, and David St. Hummus from Spinal Tap. And he and if, hopefully he's not listening tonight. I'm sure he's not. The next day is his birthday, so we're doing a little bit of a special thing. Wink, wink. Uh, and uh, nice to have Tom here for his birthday. Uh, from William Tagalamonte says, uh, thank you all for a great show. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, and yeah, Nat Romero saying, great questions, Tom. You're the best co-host. You'll be missed, and we will miss you. But we're going to keep this going in Tom's honor. And Tom, you know when you're all said and done, too, when this all is uh, wrapped up, you come back on as a guest co-host whenever you want. The invitation will always be open for you and get you back on and say what it was like. And maybe if you've lost any more hair after uh, wrapping up number six, you know, season six. It's going to be fantastic, but um, that'll be definite. One thing we're going to mention to our guests as well too: we still have a contest going on over on our Instagram. It's Instagram.com/slash Inside the Gilliverse. All you have to do is like us and uh, repost one of our things. We're giving away one of the uh, Royal Bobbles and Bobbleheads.com Hector Salamanca uh, bobblehead figures. Fantastic! He's actually got the bell that rings. You can barely see him back there right now. I should have brought one a little closer, uh, but they're fantastic. Uh, and again, tune in next uh, Friday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. From Michael McKee and Chuck McGill, that's going to be a fantastic one. I know we didn't get a chance to get to everybody's questions here this evening, uh, but Max, I'm going to give you an open invitation whenever you'd like to come back uh, and maybe just throw out the, like we're going to be running this all through season six and after season six as a recap and maybe a couple episodes. Uh, we'll have some several people on as a panel, bring you back on and some of the other actors. Love to have you again. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Tom, it's great to see you too. And uh, great seeing you. Thank you too. And thank you for doing this. It's been awesome. And a big thanks to uh, Sandra Lee over in the chat, running the chat as efficiently as possible, and her other moderators as well, too. Mark Taylor, thank you, Mark, so much for helping us. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And don't go away. Max will say goodbye to you off the air. Everyone, thanks so much for tuning in, and we can't wait to see you next week. Be safe out there. See you next Friday right here inside the Gilliverse and uh, where it smells like bacon and fear. There you go. <laughs> love it. I love it. See you soon, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in to Inside the Gillivers with Tom and Eric. Be sure to check back each week for more great discussions and interviews with cast and crew from Breaking Bad, El Camino, and Better Call Saul.